And then we move this out of the way. So you didn't see much blue. Okay. So today we're gonna to talk about galaxies and in particular galactic disks, but we're going to you know, start with the general characteristics uh, of galaxies. It seems to me like before Hubble, um, a lot of astronomy was like classification, right? There was, there was some, there were some measurements of the spectrum and things like that. Uh, but Hubble, I think, is the one who made things really quantitative. So he, this is not quantitative, or it's not very much, but he came up with the uh, Hubble sequence for uh, galaxy classification. So it is morphological. Which means that it's based on the shape of the galaxy, like what you actually observe through the telescope. Um, it was invented or published in 1926, so it's uh, almost 100 years old. It is still, I, I guess it is widely used um, in astronomy. And the classification, you know, the morphological classification is not necessarily correlated um, with physical processes, uh, but it is correlated with characteristics of the galaxies, right? like the color, Uh, the luminosity, um, the rate of um, star formation, and so on. And I think um, we're going to be able to understand pretty well why. So, also remember that correlation doesn't imply causation. So the two, I guess the three main types are elliptical galaxies. Um, spiral galaxies. And their names are pretty descriptive. And in between, you have the lenticular galaxies. Which are kind of in between. There's also irregular galaxies, like for the ones that do not really have much of a shape. So, Elliptical would you galaxies. consider would you consider a quasar a galaxy? Mm, no, I, I don't think so. But quasars are uh, active galactic nuclei, so they are the center of the galaxy. They're not the whole galaxy. But I guess for our purposes, they are the main part, right? <laughs> So elliptical galaxies are called early type. And spiral galaxies are called late type. Um, Hubble did say, quote unquote, 
the nomenclature refers to position in the sequence and temporal connotations are made at once parallel. So there's really no early or late type. You know, most galaxies were formated, were, were uh, formed at the same uh, time. But we'll see why they're called like that. So for elliptical, the first one will be E0. And you have other stuff in between, up to E7 or so. So you're going to become more, more elliptical. So this is like an E3, and this one is like an E5. And this for the number is given by 10 times 1 minus V over A. This will be semi major axis um, and the semi minor axis. So the E0 will be you know, perfectly spherical galaxy. And then as they become more elongated, um, you change the number over here. There is some um, discussion, I guess, in the community, whether E5s, you know, E6s and E7s actually exist. Uh, they think that maybe they only go to like E4 and things that are more elliptical than that. We're just like looking looking at them at a very slanted angle and we cannot really, you know, see that they're not elliptical. They might be something else. Um, but you Do know, they oscillate? If they oscillate? Yeah, because like it looks kind of like an orbit, like how the Earth's orbit oscillates from uh, an oval to like a circle? Mm, no, I, I, well, I don't think they will oscillate. Um, I think they will remain, you know, not unchanged for their whole history. Um, but if they are, you know, pre-spherical, they're going to remain spherical. Um, but they can change their shape if they collide with other galaxies. Um, you know, otherwise, it's going to be pretty much um, just the stars rotating uh, around. Uh, but your question uh, made me think about the stars in the galaxies. So in spiral galaxies like the Milky Way, you have like the stars rotating around the center. Um, but in these ones, the stars are oscillating uh, around the center in kind of uh, random directions, right? So over here, uh, you, you can assume that the you know, distribution is completely uniform or random. And so you have stars going in every direction. And so that's why you get a sphere. And over here, you're going to have like some preference, right? Um, maybe you're not going to have any stars going like this, but you have plenty going you know, like this. Um, but there's yeah, there's no there's no time implied in the classification. It's just how they how they look to us. Okay. So the ones that are the lenticular ones, they're called S0. So it's like the first version where it is the, the less spiral of the spiral galaxies. And you're going to have a disk 
um, of perfectly uniform density. And then you have the bulge. And you have you know, a lot of mass in the bulge. So it is a combination of like an elliptical galaxy, you know, with the, the sphere inside and the spiral part, you have the, the disk. And it is not clear, it's also you know, a matter of debate. Um, but some, some scientists think that uh, kind of all the galaxies start the same, you know, with, a, with the central bulge. And then you know, some of them will develop the, uh, the spiral arms maybe all of them until they collide with other, with other things. But you know, that is not, it is not clear that that is true. Um, but the center of galaxies, of spiral galaxies, do tend to have more characteristics of, uh, of elliptical galaxies, like the kind of stars that you can see over there. And we'll talk about that um, in a little bit. And then, you know, the S0 is going to divide into uh, these ones, we can call them like pure spiral galaxies. These ones are going to be uh, barred spiral. So the main characteristic of which we're going to have A, A, SBB, SBC, SB, and SC. The main characteristic is the luminosity that you have in the in the central bulge and luminosity in the in the um, spiral arms or in the disk. So the A types are going to have most of their luminosity in the bulge. Um, and then the arms are going to be not super well defined, you know, so closer to this one in which you have a perfect disk, you might be able to resolve you know, some of the arms, but they're going to be pretty pretty broad and not a lot of luminosity. And the barred ones are the same, except that instead of having just the spherical bulge, we have a bar. Um, other than that, you know, it might look kind of the same. And then this one you have, you know, relatively speaking, um, less luminosity in the central bulge, more luminosity in the spiral arms, and the arms are going to be better defined. Uh, so maybe like, kind of like that. And then for this one, you have about the same luminosity in the bulge and in the arms. And you might have more, and typically you're gonna have more structure. You're gonna have several arms or something. And you have the same over here, except that it is bar. So, any idea where the Milky Way is? Or what is the classification of the Milky Way? Wouldn't it be an SBA? It is an SB, but it's closer to an SBC. So the the arms are pretty well um, defined. Defined, yeah. So you will, 
we have, I guess we cannot really see it, right? But looks more like that. And the sun is over here in between uh, bright bands, or you know, this is also interstellar medium, not, not just uh, stars. But yeah, maybe it's not completely SBC, but it's in between B and C and it's part. And yeah, we're learning more about it. So it is also not perfectly um, uh, circular, but it has a little bit of um, it's a little elliptic, elliptical, and if you look at it like this, um, some of the matter goes down a little at the edges, and over here it goes up. Not not by much, you know. Like for the most part, it just looks like a like a spiral, like a circular spiral. But if you look at the details, it has a little bit more structure. So, you know, as you can see, the classification, you know, especially for the spiral galaxies, is not super quantitative. But it's, it's a useful classification. And there are classifications that, that expand upon the, the Hubble sequence, and they have like intermediate things, and um, they try to be more quantitative. So they use like the mass or other characteristics. But this is you know, by far the most widely used uh, classification for galaxies. And you know, irregular, um, I guess, includes almost everything else. The other shape that galaxies can take, but it's pretty rare, is uh, they're called uh, prolate rotator galaxies. They look like like cylinders or like uh, cigars, and they're rotating like this. <coughs> and it is believed that they're the result of uh, right angle collisions between spiral galaxies. So let's look at some of the properties. So the shape, well, it's pretty self-evident. This is going to be a sphere or ellipse. This is going to be a disk, uh, likely with um, spiral arms. The star motion, I mentioned it um, a few minutes ago. So the velocity, let's see, let's try to make a little piece here. The velocity is mostly radial. So you know, they're just moving kind of like this in every direction. Um, they orbit the center. And the angle, you know, with the center, or if you could define, you know, kind of a, a plane, it's, it's random. And then these ones, the velocity, they have, um, So tangential 
they are orbiting the center. But in a in a disk. A very important characteristic you know, that separates the elliptical and the spiral galaxies is that elliptical galaxies have very little or even no uh, gas or dust. And the spiral galaxies have plenty. So what are the consequences of these? The elliptical having very little gas. For example, in terms of star formation. Come on, you know this. It's it's kind of weird. Like it says that ellipticals are younger, you know, younger galaxies, but wouldn't you expect them to be older with like all their materials being used up for stars and stuff? Well, you know, our our human mind wants to impose some sort of evolution for galaxies. But you know, there's there's nothing like that. They're just this is just their shape. Uh, so don't call them old or young. You know, they were created after the Big Bang. The Big Bang, so they're the same age. But it does have um, relevance, right? If there's very little gas or dust then the rate of star formation is going to be very low. There's, there's no new stars being formed. And if there are no new stars, that means that almost all of their stars are going to be old. And I think that's why um, you know, what you're reading or what you're looking at, what they're trying to say. So, here in spiral galaxies, uh, there's a lot of uh, star formation in the spiral arms. Here, there's no star formation. So, you know, because of this ISM, um, we can so star population mostly small old red stars and mostly population two stars. Um, what are, what, what is population two? Well, you had the very first uh, stars that were created, they were pretty humongous um, because of you know, the genes mass that was required uh, at that temperature they had no metals, so no, no carbon or anything. So their metallicity was zero. After those stars died, you know, they exploded and they enriched the medium, they created population two stars. So they do have some metal, but it's low. Uh, spiral galaxies have young, you know, they have a, a collection, also old stars, but 
Many of them are, are young, uh, they're massive, they're bright. I guess here you can say that they're dim. They're uh, blue. And most of them, most of the stars are population three. Right, so these were created after the population two stars died and enrich the interstellar medium with their metals. So what population does the sun belong, belong to? Population three. It's a third generation star, the sun. Okay, so most of these, the young, massive, bright blue stars are going to be in the arms. The, the central bulge is mostly population to older stars. So star formation. Um, low to null. And here for spiral galaxies is high. Yeah, particularly um, at the in the arms. And this makes sense. There's a lot of um, gas and dust in between and because you have arms you know you have density mass density waves essentially so they they can more easily you know, just uh, accrete into stars here there's no gas there's nothing they're kind of uh, interesting so can you imagine living in one of these old elliptical galaxies The sun will be in dimmer. Well, there will be more stars. So, see. Elliptical galaxies are more diverse in terms of size, mass, and luminosity. So in terms of size, they go from 10 to the negative one to 10 to the positive two kiloparsecs. So this will be uh, 3,000 light years or so, a kiloparsec. Um, spiral galaxies, they are in the 10 to the one kiloparsec range. For the mass, some of them are pretty tiny, 10 to the 7, but some of them are pretty humongous, 10 to the 13 solar masses. The range for spiral is 10 to the 9, 10 to the 12. And the luminosity from 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 13 solar luminosities and spiral 10 to the 8 and 10 to the 11 solar luminosities. So the range is much wider for elliptical than for spiral galaxies. So, you know, there might be smaller spiral galaxies that we have not detected, but in general, you're going to have these, like if they're too small, they'll probably just collapse quickly into an elliptical galaxy. They will not have arms for too long or at all. Um, and here you have a much wider range of 
mass and size for the elliptical galaxies because they probably underwent a lot of collisions with other galaxies, so they have merged. So both of them have supermassive black holes in their respective centers. And this, I think, tells a lot of the of the story of why there are you know, such differences between elliptical and spiral galaxies is their location. So elliptical galaxies are you know, not always, but most of the time. Um, close to the center of galaxy clusters. And spiral galaxies are preferentially away. They have undergo likely many mergers and spiral likely none or you know minor with like dwarf galaxies. So there is you know much more uh, dark matter and matter the center of galaxy clusters. So they um, ignited right most of their of their gas into stars kind of early on, and then um, you know when when there's so much mass like in the center of um, galactic clusters, the interstellar medium tends to flow towards, or I, I guess away from the uh, elliptical galaxies and into uh, intergalactic space. And you know, this is related to the paper that you uh, discussed, uh, dis uh, discuss <laughs> that you talked about before, <laughs> sorry. Um, so when you have the collisions between galaxies, you know, like, the, the stars themselves don't collide almost ever, um, but the gas you know, is more difficult. It gets trapped by the bigger galaxy or it gets like stripped away. It will have a different velocity than the stars. So they lose their, their, um, uh, their gas and they cannot create more stars anymore. So, how popular is the elliptical shape? Uh, about 50%. And spiral, about 60%. And you know, irregular and other things, I guess irregular, um, everything else. All right. Is our galaxy gonna turn into an elliptical once it, hits, it collides with Andromeda? Our galaxy, Milcomeda? Yeah. I will, it will become elliptical eventually. So, you know, they're in between four and four to five billion years, they're gonna start colliding. Um, but they're going to like move past each other and then they're gonna go back. And then um, the other galaxies, you know, the, the dwarf galaxies, like the, uh, the triangulum and all of those, you know, they will rotate and then collide with Milcomeda. So it will become um, an elliptical galaxy eventually. 
it's, you know, it's kind of the the end state you know, after after many collisions. Okay, so let's look a little bit. Let's look at these galaxies in more detail. So, as I mentioned last time, you know, let's say that this is a Milky Way. Um, spiral galaxies are going to consist of this central bulge, and then they have their spiral arms. And they are in the middle of these dark matter um, halos. They are mostly spherical and much bigger than the visible part of the galaxy. Um, there might be a little bit um, um, preferentially towards the the plane of the galaxy just because there's more visible matter here and more matter overall. But they're going to be big and for the most part spherical. So we can map the gravitational potential that is moving the stars uh, by looking at the velocity of the stars, the interstellar medium, whatever we can find in there, and give us um, a hint. So, the um, Milky Way maybe is going to look. Mm, actually, if you want to show the whole disk, the central bulge is probably like this. So the radius, the radius, let's say that it starts in the center of the galaxy. The radius of the central bulge is about one kilo per second. And I guess each bulge should be a little smaller. So the distance of the sun to the center of the galaxy, let's call it R naught is about eight kiloparsecs. And in fact, in fact, I think it was defined by the um, International um, Union as exactly eight. And the whole thing is about uh, 50. Kiloparsecs. So the central bulge is much smaller, um, but it does have quite a bit of mass. So the sun is actually a little bit, you know, it's in the main disk, but it's kind of down here. And the North Pole of the Earth is in this direction. So, you know, if you want to think about it that way, uh, when you look up, you're kind of going, you're looking down or away from the galaxy or the galactic plane. And if you go to the North Pole, uh, you cannot see the Milky Way.
So if you go to the south pole, that's much better. So for cylindrical symmetry, you know, we're going to imagine that it's just like a cut of a cylinder. The tangential component of the velocity in the plane of the galaxy is given by given by Newton's second law. Actually, let's just keep this one as R. So this is the um, the gravitational potential. So this whole thing, the derivative of the potential with respect to distance is the force for mass. And this is the centripetal acceleration. I, I can't read the red mark. <laughs> you cannot? Mm, I mean, I know what you said. You said centripetal acceleration in force per mass yes it's just a really pain marker okay. but if you if you want us to read it it's i will use this one is this better slightly yes <laughs> yeah better well that was it centripetal acceleration So the galaxy has three main components in terms of the mass. It will be the central bulge, the disk, and the dark matter halo. So let's look at the central bulge first. Was, so in a sense, all galaxies are ellipt elliptical, just like the whole medium is determines it. Like if it has outwarding um, arms. You read that? Jacob? Yeah. Could you repeat that? So like essentially all galaxies are elliptical because they have the bulge inside them? Yes. So all galaxies have an elliptical part, that is correct. So you know, if you want to get the dynamics of elliptical galaxies, you just forget about the disk part and you just consider the, uh, the central bulge, which is all that you have in that case. Okay, so for, and this is the, in the case of the Milky Way, uh, R less than one kiloparsec, so you are inside the bulge. This is just G and R over R squared. All right, so um, essentially the, uh, 
the equation that you have seen is 24, 20, 26, 24, 20. Um, except that this mass, it increases right, with the radius. So as you look at a bigger sphere, then um, you are enclosing more mass. Um, once you are outside, like you, know, you, you enclose all the mass, you can consider that the mass is at a single point. Um, when you are inside the sphere, this just keeps um, increasing. So if we want to plot that, it's going to be tangential velocity. So these are bulge. And it's just going to increase. And then when you are outside of the bulge, it's going to decrease like this. So that one is easy. The cylindrical part is not as easy. So you still have, okay, so that's your density, mass density. It's gonna be a small chunk in the Z direction. And then uh, sigma of R and theta. So sigma is the surface mass density. So if you're going to simulate uh, galaxies, this is one of the um, most important parameters. The Poisson equation is valid always. And in spherical coordinates, And that is equal to both pi g rho and rho in states. So, not super user friendly, but there are a few simpler solutions or yeah, solutions. So one of them is called the minute. Nestle disk. And this is um, a solution that was found by Nestle. So in this case, the surface 
density. It's given by n to pi r r. This is script r. So a script R uh, radius is the radius of the of the disk. Another one is called the foreign disk. So here, n is the total mass um, of the disk. Right, so these are just um, surface density functions. So this one, the final final rest of disk, there's an arc cosine there. So it just looks um, kind of like this. And over here you have the radius of the disk. So you have um, more matter towards the center and then kind of decreases um, and obviously you don't have anything after uh, script R. This one, the McLaren, is pretty similar. Um, it's kind of look more like Right, so you don't have the small peak at the at the center of the disk. So here, yeah, these are just um, surface density. So one of the potentials. the Kasmin potential. zero equals zero, and this is just minus gm over r square plus z squared to the one half. And you probably saw something similar to this in uh, analytical mechanics. So this is you know, the potential due to a um, a disk with uniform mass density. So you know here the negative only means that it is attractive. This is over two, can you see it? Yes, right. Mm. 
So I have the radius of the disk, half of the radius, twice the radius, and three times uh, the radius. And over here is the normalized potential, the potential at zero, divided by the divided by the potential at zero. And uh, for different Zs, there it's going to look somewhat different. So and this is always going up to zero. This is for Z equals zero. And then as you move to higher Z, this looks more just like a, like a straight line. Still going up. And this one, another kind of in between. So maybe we'll go down a little, but then go up. Right, so this is just a shape of your potential. So what is important to notice here is that in this part, the derivative of the potential with respect to R is about constant, right? Uh, you have a little bit of structure in here and here, but for the most part, um, it's constant. So that means that uh, V naught is going to we have the R over here. We can move it to the other side constant R, um, the one half. So for a good range, this is just a slowly increasing curve for the tangential velocity. So now we can go back to our other plot. This is the tangential velocity. This is the radius. So the central bulge or the tangential velocity due to the central bulge, kind of like this. And then the one for the one due to the disk increases kind of like this. So the total going to look maybe with a little bit of uh, it's going to look a little bit like this so it has a minimum uh, where the potential of the disk becomes dominant over the potential of the central bulge. And then it will continue uh, increasing you know, very, very slowly. 
So this is actually what we observe for the Milky Way. So this will be the radius of the bulge. Um, this minimum is at about uh, three kilo parsecs. And it continues increasing up to about um, five kiloparsecs. So up to here, we don't need um, any dark matter or anything. The problem is that we do know that the surface density of the Milky Way is not uh, uniform, but it thins out towards the edges. And so if the matter, the amount of uh, mass decreases, then the tangential velocity should start going down again. Um, but we don't see that. What we see is that after five kiloparsecs, it's constant. And it's constant, so constant up to like 50 for the edge, the edge of the galaxy. And remember that the sun is over here at eight. Wow, you think it deteriorate after after that much time? What Not do you keep mean constant. So I guess what people think uh, these days is that you have well as I, as I mentioned, uh, there's uh, the dark matter halo is mostly spherical. Um, so it will look a little bit like this, except that the is not um, uniformly uh, distributed, it's, uh, it's density. Yeah, there's sub holes, right? There's sub um, halos in there too. Um, you mean like dark matter halo holes? Yeah, there's. Isn't, I remember reading it for the project that there was sub um, dark matter halos, and the the galaxy like holding it together. I guess kind of like a microwave that like some spots are hotter than the others. Mm. So, can you do me a favor? Can you search for um, a large scale structure of the universe? That would be really nice if you could share that with. Uh, with the class, that would be, be pretty difficult to draw that. Um, uh, actually, um, where's that book? Sorry, I should have thought about this before.
So this is how the large scale structure of the universe looks like. So each bright point is a galaxy. And you know, we can, oh, awesome. And we can map it up uh, out to like a very high um, redshift, so very early in the universe. Um, you can see it a little, maybe a little better, a little bit better here. So it's the same stuff. So just trying to comprehend the scale of that is mind-boggling. It is. It is mind-boggling. So I guess what Jacob was referring to is that, um, you know, it is believed that all of this structure is really created by, by dark matter. And in some of those spots, you know, where you have more, where you have um, conglomeration of dark matter, uh, regular matter is going to fall into those gravitational sinks and it's going to form galaxies. So galaxies, you know, they do form kind of in the center of these dark matter halos. Um, this is really, yeah, this is pretty beautiful. It also has um, a lot of very interesting statistical properties. Is that a radio, radio like photo or is it the... This one's? Yeah. No, so what they do is, um, they use, I guess they can use uh, any kind of telescope, um, visible or you know, even radio, uh, infrared. And they look at different galaxies and they measure the red shift. So the, the red shift is telling you how far away the galaxy is. So you can map it you know, out from the distance from the Milky Way. Um, I think the first big one is called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And you know, if you look, I guess they don't show you here, but uh, we plot it as a disk because you know, it's radial distance from the Milky Way, but there are like big chunks in which there's nothing, right? Because the Milky Way doesn't let us observe uh, in those directions. So we're actually kind of limited in our in our vision because the the Milky Way well, well, we are inside the Milky Way, so it obscures a lot of galaxies. Okay, so you know really. how this tangential velocity plot looks like. This is 50 kiloparsecs, 25, 12, 6, 3, 1. It looks like that. So this is the, the bulge at the beginning, and then you have the effect you know, where it's dominant the, the matter of the disk, and then the rest, um, the gravity of the of the dark matter halo is dominant. Um, so the halos, you know, they are spherical because they don't interact. You know, these particles, whatever they are, they don't interact uh, with almost anything, so they cannot lose um, enough energy. But uh, baryonic, you know, 
regular matter, it does uh, radiate away its energy. And so it allows it to condense into what, what we see as spiral or, uh, or elliptical galaxies. So yeah, galaxies are kind of cool. Okay, so that's what I have for you today. Uh, any questions or comments or anything else? I wanted to ask something kind of silly. Uh -huh. We're speaking about like halos of dark matter and stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. And then sometimes we do kind of see halos of uh, actual matter and even shells and stuff like that. Right? Uh -huh. Could there be an actual like solid two-dimensional halo? Like a platform of so sorts? Um, or do we need like forerunners that think that wiping all the life in the universe is necessary for that? Uh, I didn't, I didn't get it. So what do you mean two dimensional? Like this? So I just, it, it like, in which you have two degrees of freedom, right? Uh -huh. So this is for dark matter. Well, in, re in general for, for matter, I'm thinking like an actual like halo planet. Um, again, the two degrees of freedom is you say in cylindrical coordinates, for example, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, you have Z and theta, but R is constant. And you have like a solid halo, like that. Is that something that could like actually happen with time or something like that? Like things in a, in a halo that, of things that are separated, coming together gravitationally, and then like ending up creating like a sort of star of sorts like that? Sounds very unlikely, but would the physics say it's possible? And the last part was a bad joke that I'm not sure anyone would get. Okay. Um, so I'm not completely sure I'm understanding what you're saying. So you're saying that there's a two-dimensional uh, halo, but you know, halo, I think what it means is like, diffuse matter right so i mean yeah we usually talk about diffuse matter once but i'm thinking like if it could be possible to have one of the, one solid halo okay what would that do what what would they do just just exist like what um i i think it would be very difficult it's like a ring yeah like a ring Yes, it would be saying, very difficult. But... You were saying constant R, but then it can go in theta and Z? Yeah. Mm. Again, you would have like the diffuse matter in my mind, but then if you switch geometry, you can say that you have like a, a line or not a line, but like a strip of matter and say that like if you flatten it out, if you consider like non-Euclidean geometry, um, then you could say like it's kind of like it has, it shares some properties with like a, a flat strip and then that like flattening out the, the, the planets like um, tidally like squishing together so that they end up like with just the, again, a solid fl flat strip, but it's in like spherical space. And so it's actually like a ring. It is very out there. That's why I said it was kind of a silly question, but. Mm, so what I was thinking is, you know, the cigar shaped uh, galaxies. Um, you know, they rotate like this. They do have some structure, right, in, mm -hmm. the, uh, in the oh. z-axis, but they are rotating yeah. like this. So mm -hmm. maybe in that case, you know, the dark matter halo will also be rotating like that. But that, that's too big to create a solid object, no? Maybe that's also the problem. I'm thinking of too small scale 
and maybe such dynamics are not you, possible you create on a smaller scale. You cannot create a solid object with, with dark matter because it okay. doesn't interact. But I'm not talking about dark matter. I'm talking about like, we've talked about uh, halos and shells of, of actual like normal matter. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's kind of more what I'm thinking. I don't think it will do that because the the minimum energy, gravitational energy, for a configuration of matter is spherical. Um, but if it's rotating very fast and you're mm -hmm. right at the right angular velocity. That's what I'm thinking. It would be like the the rotational uh, energy needs to be pretty high. Yes. And I can imagine like something that like um, a bunch of matter that's like rotating at super high speeds and then it starts coming together. Very, and it's, very like, high. Kinda... So I think it will be extremely unstable. That's another thing. It would probably collapse under its own gravity. Or explode. Or just move <laughs> away. Would it, if, if it was like um, artificially made, would it be able to hold up? Maybe if it's not bigger. Mm. I'm sure there are a lot of videos of this in YouTube. Um, well, you know, if we were considering uh, creating wormholes, <laughs> that are also rotating like this if, to tra traverse them. What, a wormhole? That was one of the, you know from that was one of the papers, but you did another research project. You did the, oh. um, yeah, the, the computational, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think if you have a control device, um, yeah. you could do it. But I think it will be like really, really tough. Yeah, it seems unstable. Maybe like a, a torus would be more likely. I think so. I think it will be easier if it gives you uh -huh. some um, liberty to in this plane. That makes sense. It's a shame it would be a cool planet. <laughs> and again, maybe you could like end up creating a weapon with it to destroy life in the universe. Yeah, that's the ultimate purpose, right? Uh, yeah. But why, why else would you create a, such a halo structure? I don't think you should call it a halo structure though. It's just, you know, a weird gravitational I mean, this idea is literally just coming from the games. So that's that's all my references are. I think that's why I also said it's silly. I mean, I, I I mean it. Could you could you do it? Could you stabilize it? But it's um, one of those cases like a lightsaber. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah. The same thing. That one also but, seems pretty sense. difficult to create, no? What is uh, a lightsaber? Yeah. Mm, well, the way you have it in the movies, I suppose it would be like plasma, right? Then it's not light. Um, huh? If it's plasma, it's not light. Well, do you want to create like an actual, how would you cut things with light? I guess, yeah, but it wouldn't look solid. It wouldn't look like that probably. <laughs> It's but it's not, it's not a lightsaber in the sense that it has to uh, live up to its own name. Again, it's, it's a, it's a sci-fi. It's a lightsaber in the sense that it's just like a blade of uh, pure thing, like, I don't know, lightning, uh, no, like uh, shiny matter, some what that like retracts. Yeah. There, there is, uh, no, they, they make uh, weird noises, right? Weird sounds. I mean, yeah, that's also pretty cool. There's, I was going to tell you, there's this YouTuber who uh, like kind of lives off of creating things from sci-fi 
in real life and they've done like a few lightsabers. The latest one is just like fire. So what I think it's it's a disadvantage of it, it's like it, it mostly just like melts things and it doesn't cut through them. So when you're, you're, when you're cutting something, it takes a while to like go through that thing, right? And, and for example, when you see Qui-Gon in, in The Phantom Menace, you have it um, like, he's, he's cutting through a door, so like the lightsaber immediately goes through it and then um, he makes a circle. So I think that's kind, of, that's kind of part of the cool factor. But these guys literally just use like laminar flow with fire. And that's how they create like retractable lightsaber. How do they stop the flow? Well, they stop the the fuel. Like they stop feeding it gas. Oh, you mean like well, no, I don't, I'm not sure what you mean. If it's it the height, you length, can control right? how much gas you give it. But what are you saying? It has a finite length. Yeah. And because it's just fire. And it is laminar for that length, and then it becomes turbulent and disappears or something. Uh huh. That's that's literally it. I bored everyone out. They all left. <laughs> I guess I guess Dante and Ramon are interested in lightsabers. I'm still here. <laughs> yeah. I'm writing a cool. writing a paper, and I forgot I was here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I see. Thank you. It's it's okay. Jorge, what are you doing for Thanksgiving? Let me stop oh, recording. Good.